change, international organizations moving beyond their mandates. There's really a fascinating approach to these questions, and its author, Nina Hall, um, has graced us with their presence tonight and given us an opportunity to have a really, what I hope will be, meaningful and interesting discussion um, about these critical issues. So Nina's book really, I think, builds on a big theoretical strand in international relations literature, which moves us beyond what many of you students here will know as the principal agent dilemma. So if you, have a, if you create an organization if you, as a group of states, and that organization then doesn't go and do what you want, you have what's called a principal agent dilemma, where you can't really control the agent you've created. But Nina's book is actually showing us that that whole paradigm is maybe not the right way to think about these issues. And actually, the agents may have a lot of agency to direct things in a way that may actually be quite helpful in some cases. So um, a really interesting theoretical in innovation, and one that also gives us uh, some insights into some pressing global challenges. Um, I'm delighted that we have such a great group of uh, panelists here to discuss this issue. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce them now, but you've seen their bios on the website. Um, just starting from my left uh, is Akim Steiner. Akim is the director of the Martin School here in Oxford, or has been for uh, a month, two yeah. months or so, um, but comes to us from a vast experience in international environmental issues, most recently as the director of the United Nations Environmental Program and uh, Under Secretary General um, for the last 10 years. Before that, Akeem worked in, at IUCN and started as a development economist, um, and so has, a, has seen this issue from a number of different perspectives. Um, to his right, looking at the panel, we have uh, Sam Dawes. Sam is the director of the Project on UN Governance and Reform at the Center for International Studies here at Oxford, um, and also has a vast range of experience in the policy world, focused mostly on um, the United Nations uh, Secretary General and the, the um, sort of New York level kind of discussions of, of uh, UN work, working also in the British, uh, British government uh, for the UK's liaison, liaising with the international institutions, um, and uh, is now pursuing those ideas in an academic context. Then moving further down the panel, we have um, Professor Alex Betts. Alex is the director of the Center for Refugee Studies here. Um, and a well-recognized international voice on questions of refugees and migration and forced migration, um, and also a contributor to many uh, policy discussions on that matter, and a close observer of different kinds of international organizations that operate in that realm. Um, and last, but certainly not least, is the author of this book we have in front of us, Nina Hall. Nina is an assistant professor at the Heritage School of Governments, Governance in Berlin, um, and is, uh, amongst many other outstanding qualities, an alumnus of this very institution, which I happen to notice actually all of our panelists are to some degree, have some, some have some degree from this university, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so for students in the room, I hope this is an inspiring uh, appetizer for what you, you may think about doing uh, after you leave this place. So without further ado, let me just note, we're going to not have a traditional academic kind of discussion tonight. We're going to have maybe something a bit more like a talk show format, where we try to create a more kind of interactive discussion uh, between us up here, but also everyone in the audience. So please think about your questions as we're talking, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully get a chance to address them. Um, but let me start with the book at hand and turn to you, Nina. Um, and just ask you, first and foremost, you know, why do we see this increasing attention to climate change amongst international organizations that may not have anything to do with climate change on first glance? Yeah, thanks, Tom, and thanks for everyone for coming and to the great panel. So the book that I've written is, starts off in looking at international institutions that have no mandate for environment or climate change. So I look at the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, so it's great we have Alex here, I look at the United Nations Development Program and the, United Nation, or the International Organization for Migration, which has recently become part of the UN, but hasn't, hasn't got a UN abbreviation yet anyway. And the question that I really am interested in, and how are these organizations engaging with a new issue, that's climate change, that they were never established to deal with? Because if we go back to when many of our institutions were created in the 1950s and the post-World War II era, they were created with very different context and very different problems in mind. So if we look at UNHCR, it was to deal with European refugees. Refugees, for many of you in the room may know, are only those who are fleeing persecution 
it's not somebody who is fleeing a natural disaster. So a refugee, the convention by definition does not include people who are displaced by a natural disaster. And similarly, IOM, when it was set up, was moving people from Europe to Australasia, to the Americas. It had a fleet of boats that it actually moved people in. Now, the question that I ask in the book is, well, 60 years later, where are we? We're in a very different world. These institutions still persist, but they're faced with new challenges, and one of these is climate change. And as we know, first of all, we've seen increasing severity and frequency of natural disasters. In the last year, in 2015, for instance, we had over 22,000 people were killed by natural disasters, and we also had uh, almost 100 million other people affected, and up to 66 billion US dollars in damages by natural disasters. So for, that's the first reason. We've seen also very strong adverse impacts of climate change on developing countries. And alongside that, there's been an increasing awareness. There's been an increasing awareness in the international community that these natural disasters are caused by climate change and that the climate change negotiations, which started out in the 90s, very much focusing on how do we stop climate change, how do we mitigate it, broadened. And the book examines how the negotiations broadened, particularly in the 2000s after the Kyoto Protocol was signed. And people became aware that climate change was already here, it was having impacts, and that we actually needed to be addressing these, and that the international development and humanitarian community had a role to play. There was a very key tipping point moment when one leader of the humanitarian community said, climate change isn't just impacting on polar bears, that you might remember was the initial image, it's also impacting on people. So in answer to your question, there has been a big shift in the way international institutions see climate change. Early in the 90s, it was very much mitigation. It was about environmental institutions being involved. And later in the, in the mid-2000s and later 2000s, we see humanitarian actors like UNHCR, IOM, UNDP, involving and offering humanitarian assistance in natural disasters and also sometimes trying to push even further beyond their mandates, which we can talk about in question and answer, by, in UNHCR's case, attempting to establish what's known as a new protection mandate for people who are displaced across borders but don't fit in the refugee convention. Mm. So this increasing recognition that climate change impacted more than just polar bears was clearly a kind of key driver here. But how were international organizations, which are, after all, legal entities created by nation states, for nation states, of nation states, how were they able to convince people that they should be expanding their mandates in the way that you've described? Yeah, and this really question comes to the theoretical dimensions of my book. So Tom's already introduced one of the big debates in international relations theories, and that's principal agent theory. Many of the theories of, of international organizations are driven by explanations of what states want. States create these institutions, they fund them, they set their priorities, their strategic priorities, they monitor them, they're on the board. And what I do in the book is try and pull out and say, but states aren't setting all of the parameters. The members, the staff of these organizations, the international bureaucrats who may sit in Geneva and New York on the ground in Kenya, where I did my research in all of these places, can actually play quite a pivotal role in trying to push and lobby member states over time to expand the mandate. And the argument that I make is nuanced because I don't say they're always trying to expand. So there's a, there is one sort of explanation in the literature that you know, bureaucracies just always seek to maximize their scope, maximize their autonomy. But I show that actually they expand when they see a strong, what I call issue linkage between the, their core mandate, refugees, migration, and a new issue, climate change. So in the case of UNHCR, actually, initially the organization is quite resistant. It's reluctant to expand because the staff of that organization think these new terminologies of climate refugees will undermine the special, unique status that refugees have. That's refugees who are fleeing persecution, the, the Geneva Convention definition. So my argument is, is more nuanced than we just see mandate expansion happening because staff are always trying to expand. I'm saying that staff have a role to play in pushing member states, and they do it on the basis of when they see a strong issue linkage to their mandate. And do they succeed? I mean, if you're a state that doesn't like this, do you have ways to stop it? And have you seen that happen as well? 
or so yeah so in the three cases what happens um, in short in IOM you see member states initially reluctant for the organization to talk about climate change and migration mm -hmm. and the organization continues to publish papers reports hold events do many climate change um, projects they have over 500 projects they have a whole book that they hand out to member states in Copenhagen and over time, states accept that this is an area that should be a strategic priority for the organization. Similarly, in UNDP, we see climate change and environment actually go up and down in terms of the priorities of the organization. But by the time we get to the mid-2000s, we see UNDP releasing in 2007 the Human Development Report. It's one of their signature reports on climate change. And by the time we have Helen Clark in office, the current administrator, she's saying UNDP is the lead agency on adaptation in the UN system. So again, we see a success of a case where the, member, the staff are pushing back and saying to the member states, this is a priority. UNHCR is a bit more complex. In the case of UNHCR, we do see the agency expanding its humanitarian op operations to deliver assistance to IDPs, to internally displaced peoples who may be affected by natural disasters. And the case, though, as I mentioned before, of people displaced across international borders is a little bit more complex because the High Commissioner in 2011 asked member states, he said, will you give me a protection mandate for people who are not convention refugees but may be displaced by a range of other reasons, including climate change? And in that case, member states did push back. But he didn't stop there. And we can perhaps talk about this because I know others on the panel have expertise. Alongside states that were sympathetic, they set up the Nansen Initiative to try and push and think through new protection solutions for people who fell outside of the refugee convention. So in the end of the day, all of the cases, we see the organizations pushing and trying to move beyond their original mandates. Right, and in that particular case, that commissioner then of course is now the secretary general elect going into next year. So exactly. an interesting case to look at uh, in a little bit. Um, how should we think about legitimacy, given this argument though? Um, you've talked about how international organizations are able to expand their mandates uh, following strategic issue linkages, how they can proceed even sometimes in the face of opposition. Um, should we be worried as citizens of the world that are, in some in many cases, elected governments are not getting uh, the kind of agent principal relationship they originally intended from bureaucrats? Or is that okay? So I think it depends on your view of the role of these international organizations. If we take a sort of status principal agent view that they're accountable back to member states, that member states establish them and they should only do what member states ask them in a very direct way, then perhaps it's a problem. But I think, and international relations does suggest this, that they have other roles that we also, states delegate to them because they want their expertise. They have authority based on that expertise and they want international civil servants to do some of the thinking. What are the global issues that us as sovereign states aren't always taking into account? They also have a level of moral authority that, again, I think states often are expecting from them. Mm -hmm. And that moral authority, often in the case of many UN agencies, is to actually protect the most vulnerable, to think of the, the, the benefits for the international community. And if we take both of those cases, I think what we're seeing is staff, in many cases, um, thinking beyond any individual na nation state and thinking, who are the vulnerable people in this context who are being affected by climate change that nation states aren't thinking about? I would issue, though, one word of caution. The book isn't suggesting that international institutions should always change, should always evolve, because obviously there's a tendency for us to point fingers at the UN and say, it's this old dinosaur, it never changes, it should be a more adaptive. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think adaptation can be good. But it also highlights in the book that there are times where if organizations expand so far beyond their expertise and end up doing things where they don't know what they're doing, this can be a problem. And one example of this is the International Organization for Migration in Kenya, where I visited uh, two of the refugee camps, one in Kakuma on the border with South Sudan, and IOM, which is an organization that does a lot of logistics, moving refugees and migrants, was trying to promote agriculture with nomadic pastoralists, an area that they had very little expertise and an issue that's very, very problematic. They were doing so in an arid area where agriculture is very difficult in and of itself. So 
that is obviously one example. It's not necessarily representative of all of IOM's work, but I use it as a way to shed light that change and expansion into new areas all the time without sufficient expertise may be problematic. Mm, great. I mean, on that point, Alex, if I could turn to you. So um, you're a close observer of refugee and migration-related organizations. Um, Nina's told us some ways in which they've expanded their mandates, specifically vis-a-vis -vis climate change recently, or tried to in some cases. How do you see that working? Is it, are they expanding productively? Is this a productive issue linkage? Are the, is there danger of distraction, as was mentioned? So let me perhaps start with UNHCR and then move to IOM and explore what's actually happened. I think one thing that's worth recognizing is the nature of climate change as an issue area. And I think it's challenging to grapple with because causal relationships are often contested. So it's an area where epistemic knowledge is often open-ended and where there are deep uncertainties in causal relationships. We can accept um, causal relationships in terms of anthropogenic climate change. We can accept it's real. But that doesn't necessarily tell us the direct causal relationship between, say, climate change, change in natural resource use, <clears throat> social impact, and particular people's decision or constraint to move or otherwise. And so the relationship between climate change at one end of the spectrum and migration or refugee movements at the other is quite open-ended, quite contested, and quite contestable. And that creates a whole swathe of areas where actors, politicians, international organizations can advance claims that what they do has a causal connection to the climate change issue. And that creates a space where a lot of this debate has ended up being opportunistic, open to competition between agencies, and an opportunity for expanding a role. And as a consequence, partly practical responses by organizations have seen a disjuncture between the rhetoric, the sort of Geneva, New York levels, and the practice of what happens at the level of implementation on the ground. <clears throat> With UNHCR, we see that disjuncture. We see an incremental practical involvement in the response in terms of assistance for victims of natural disaster, from the Asian tsunami in 2004 through to floods and earthquakes in places like Pakistan and Haiti, through to Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. UNHCR has responded as uh, a provider of protection to victims of humanitarian disaster. And it's done that on a fairly ad hoc basis through what's called the cluster system, uh, the general way of allocating response uh, in the humanitarian system particular, to particular organizations. But away from that, its attempt to build a coherent stake in this particular debate has come mainly through the individual aspirations and ambitions of the now Secretary General-elect, Antonio Guterres, through since 2007, saying the world is changing. There are new drivers of displacement. Natural disasters and climate change are part of that, and we as a world must adapt. And what he's done is very cleverly used alternative institutional pathways to bypass having to seek a mandate from governments, to bypass the executive committee of UNHCR that's been opposed to an expansion, and working through other governmental structures or non-governmental structures like what's called the Interagency Standing Committee. Now, the Interagency Standing Committee is a coordination body that works not with states but with different organizations so that different humanitarian organizations can divide up responsibility for new areas amongst themselves. And Guterres quite cleverly used that to negotiate a lead role in protection for UNHCR away from having to seek approval by governments. And so I think you see this dual strategy a very practical on the ground response to the latest natural disaster through the normal humanitarian system versus a quite rhetorical move. You see a similar logic with IOM where there's a gap between IOM as, in a way, the international organization equivalent of a management consultancy, an organization that will take whatever work it can get provided someone's prepared for it, to pay for it to do something. And it can do that because migration is everything and nothing. It's all areas of society. So IOM can do humanitarian work. It can do natural disaster. It can play the tune that anybody wants it to play. And that's meant that its rhetorical position is effectively, and I paraphrase, we'll do anything you want us to do. Just pay us to do it and give us the mandate. And on the other hand, what they've done on the ground is quite far removed from that. It's been incoherent, inconsistent, a lot of research, a lot of paper, a lot of documentation. 
So I think there's big differences between IOM and UNHCR, but it's worth recognizing what the top-level political strategy has been versus incrementalism in practice. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting distinction between those two organizations and the different experiences and how uh, expansion of mandates has be, maybe been more productive in one case than another case. Um, and, uh, and I'm curious if you have an explanation as for why. Is it a leadership issue? Is, it a, is there something different about the DNA of those two organizations? I think or? Nina gets at this quite well in the book. I mean, one of the things that, that you hint at in your work is really the different types of mandate that these organizations have had. Mm -hmm. UNHCR has a very clear mandate. It's a normative mandate. It's a mandate connected to public international law. IOM, not having been part of the UN system until this year, has a lot more freedom. Uh, it has a very open-ended role. It's not, in the traditional sense, a normative organization. It can be programmatic. It can seek funds, programs. It has very little core organizational funding. And so that means, in its DNA, is a certain degree of opportunism, mm -hmm. a certain degree of a desire to serve states. Whereas UNHCR, yes, it has to serve its donor states, the principal agent dilemma you outlined, but it also has to be accountable to uh, host governments. It has to have permission to operate in the territories it operates in. It has to be, on some level, accountable to its mandate, which is to protect and assist refugees and provide solutions to their plight. Mm -hmm. And it has to ensure, as IOM, its corporate survival. So its mandate is more complex than being able to simply serve states and seek opportunities to expand. I mean, under Brunson McKinley, IOM had a strategy that was more or less explicitly about expansion. Mm -hmm. People like Jeff Crisp have commented that under Guterres, UNHCR had a strategy of expansion by stealth, but the by stealth, I think, shaped the tactics that were used to uh, get a foothold in this mandate. Right. And, the, and here in the Latin School, we often talk about sort of mission-driven organizations, mission-given government agencies, and I think this might be an interesting case study of that, of that issue. Uh, as, a, as someone who thinks uh, more about refugees probably than climate change on any, any given day, do you think there's some danger, though, of climate change becoming a sort of hegemonic issue area that, that sucks everything into this vortex of, um, as you say, uncertain causal relationships between many things? Or has this been a good thing for, for the movement of people? I think actually it's changed over time. So I think in, in a, the main area of the time frame that, that you looked at in your book, Nina, there was a real contestation of territory over climate change between these organizations. And I feel that they've backed off slightly. Um, the Nance initi Initiative was created in a way as a way of taking the contestation out of international organizations and placing it with a, within a state-led, informal, intergovernmental process and enabling all organizations to come up with a consensus on what was needed across different policy fields, the development side, the environmental side, etc., to address disaster-induced displacement. Mm. And I think that's meant that those organizations are no longer as focused as they were. UNHCR has in theory at least, had a refugee crisis to deal with in Europe and the Middle East. Um, IOM has been focused on whether and on what terms it can enter the UN system. And so I think for those organizations, getting a foothold on climate change has not been as strategically important as perhaps it was prior to 2015. Mm -hmm. um, I also think with the Paris deal, um, a lot of the focus has gone back into the UN FCCC process. Uh, a larger emphasis has been on disaster risk reduction, and the nexus to migration has been really pushed to one side through the Nansen Initiative, the post Nansen Initiative, and the initiative that uh, Akim will be the envoy to. Mm. Great. And that's a fantastic transition, actually, to you, Akim, uh, to, to, to speak to these questions. So maybe um, you could speak to how the sort of Nansen Initiative would be able to balance these things? Is this going to be a productive way to manage the institutional overlap that we're seeing in this area? Um, and also just to give you the kind of reverse question that I gave Alex, is there, is the kind of, uh, is there a danger that looking too much at all of the different effects of climate change will distract us from the core task of mitigation or uh, the essential task of mitigation? Or is, have environmental organizations been done a good job of, of broadening the climate world in this way? Well, let me start perhaps with the phenomenon of what is a state-led process, i.e. the Nuns Initiative was a number of states saying, Houston, we have a problem, but we don't have the legislation, essentially. And 
you know, there's a lot of debate about definitional terms, climate refugees or otherwise displaced people. I think that has more to do with, in a sense, the subsequent stage where rights are bestowed upon people, but not so much with the phenomenon. I think that was one of the disconnects that this process was dealing with. You had mandates, you had the Geneva uh, Convention and, and the associated rights of um, non Fulmo and, and so on for refugees. And at the same time, on the door was knocking a number of, you know, 1 million, 5 million, 100 million uh, and more who could be displaced by the phenomena that we were now beginning to see unfold. And I think it was an interesting decision to say, okay, in the formal mandates, right now there is not enough room. I think that was partly linked also to the politics of climate change. Mm -hmm. At the time that you described, Nina, in your book, there was still a polarity in allowing climate change to become a defining issue versus it being an emerging issue. And secondly, I think there was also a sense that member states needed more time to understand the significance of bestowing a status upon what could be tens of millions of people in addition to political refugees, etc. I think the fact that even after the Nansen Initiative, that issue has not entered the formal multilateral system, but has at the same time attracted more member states who have now set up this place um, platform for disaster displacement and you know we just had the advisory council meeting in Geneva and I was struck by the remarkable participation not only of member states but also by UN agencies NGOs academics and north and south so the issue keeps on growing in terms of a sense we actually have a problem mm -hmm. but we haven't found a way to deal with it it's now taken an intermediary step and says okay if you cannot work towards a one-step legal framework solution, let's continue to nurture the conversation about how states are dealing with it. So it's an intermediate step. I think the, <clears throat> the interesting thing about climate change is that it has become a defining issue because it literally touches on everything that will happen next. And here I take a, perhaps a slightly different view because I think as an executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, my overarching objective was to make climate change the business of every entity in the UN system. Now this is an interesting debate because mandate creep and competition over resources and so on can confuse these things significantly. But my vision of a United Nations Environment Program was not to become the 10,000 person agency. And I think this is where UNHCR sometimes struggles with being a normative organization when having morphed into a 10,000 employees or more operational entity. Um, but rather to be the environment program of the United Nations that worked consistently over 25 years to make climate change everybody's business. And that puts a slightly different angle on this issue of mandate creep um, and perhaps just three terms or four terms to, to perhaps inform the, the next part of our discussion. Why do these things happen? One is relevance. I think the you know, cynical view of relevance would be, well, climate change is the topic of the day, so we've got to be relevant to it. Yes, it exists. I actually think it is the smaller part. The bigger part is, and here back to your agent-driven model, it is actually people thinking, well, how on earth could we ignore this issue, which clearly we have a role to play in? So your own sense of relevance evolves as you begin to appreciate the issue. And I remember even development NGOs 10 years ago, some of them not so far from us here, saying that climate change was a distraction from you know, the singular focus of poverty and basic empowerment and human rights. Mm -hmm. Today, those very same development NGOs are at the forefront of arguing the climate change <coughs> nexus. So relevance is a very interesting two-edged sword. Second one is um, advocacy. Um, you know, you may view it in, in different senses, but certainly taking again my own vantage point for the United Nations Environment Program, advocating for climate change into an entire UN system was actually a core objective. And from that point of view, how do you do that? While well, you can sit on a pulpit or on, you know, stand on speaker's corner in the Hyde Park uh, setting and preach, or you begin to drive agendas. And this brings me to the third point um, of, or the second point of advocacy in the sense that sometimes you have to lead also because the system is you know, defined by inertia, conservatism, professional um, bias. Mm 
And just to give you a small example, which was an interesting moment for me, as I was helping to lead UNEP to take the environment agenda very much to the core of economic policy, you know, assessments, valuation, financial policy, it was an interesting moment where the then president of the World Bank was actually hosting with the president of Russia a Tiger Summit. So here you had UNEP working into the green economy space, into macroeconomic policy, fiscal policy, and the financial system. And a lot of people saying, what on earth is going on here? And the president of the World Bank hosting a Tiger Summit. Now, this may, in the end, be a little bit of an extreme example, but it actually points to two things. One, we in UNEP knew that we had to drive a different view of how economics relates to environment. It wasn't coming from the very institutions that were actually the custodians of the narrative on the economic sustainability discourse. And I think for the World Bank, it was also a response to the fact that it was environmentally increasingly under scrutiny and it was a high profile way of saying we're not ignorant of the issue of conservation, for example, to our work. Mm -hmm. Finally, funding. Uh, funding can be a good thing, funding can be a bad thing. Maybe we'll come back to that. I think, unfortunately, how member states handle financing of the UN system today is probably the single largest perverse driver of bad behavior on mandate creep, but I'll leave it at that for the moment. Well, that's a, a great um, issue to flag because I think we would all uh, like to come back to the issue of how funding and, and principal agents and uh, mandate creep relate to each other. But let me then, if I can ask you, uh, press you a bit further on your experience as director of the UN Environmental Program, which is, of course, the focal institution for environmental issues within the UN system, um, and was given this very broad mandate to be the custodian of those issues throughout the UN, but a limited operational mandate and you know, capacity to do so. So given that setup, how do you, as a, as a leader of one of these organizations, um, help member states, let's put it this way, help member states understand what they want to do in this world, and how do you manage them so that they, you provide that kind of epistemic uh, role that they say they're given to you but may not always realize that you're helping them address the problems they really want to help. How do you manage up, in other words, in, a, in this kind of situation? By essentially offering valuable knowledge and advice. Mm -hmm. And UNEP to this day is an organization that has you know, just about 950 employees. I mean, it then hosts a whole slew of conventions, but the core secretariat is 950 employees, and you focus essentially on what you're good at. You see, many parts of the end system have a core mandate. They should at least be the best point of reference for any member state to turn to to get both state-of-the-art thinking and a global overview, and some that you refer to, Alex, as well. So in UNEP, I think we have very often been at the forefront of understanding where science is emerging and policy needs to act. So that's one area, whether it's the Montreal Protocol and the whole the ozone layer. The first <clears throat> discussions around climate change happened in Nairobi and together under the auspices of UNEP and WMO, out of which grew the IPCC, from which then grew the UNFCCC. So I think the, the art is you have to decide whether you are, in comparison, for example, to UNDP, I would say UNEP is a... Um, wholesale entity within the UN specialized around the knowledge that we need about environmental change to understand the implications for other areas. The other part is you need member states to also recognize the value of that. So China is a very strategic client of UNEP. Um, some other countries may not see that value added. But I think above all, you need to be careful that you don't misinterpret your capacity to influence with the size of your budget, or indeed, more importantly, the size of your institution. I deliberately set at the beginning of my tenure the objective of uh, trying to double the revenue, but actually either maintain or reduce the staff, which is extremely difficult to do in, in a bureaucracy that creates a lot of process. Mm. We actually did it, and I think as a result of which we are a much stronger organization, and I think member states gain confidence. And this is the last part that I think plays a key role. We started off the discussion around leadership. Yeah. Member states issued mandates, but you know, quite frankly, some of these mandates are 20, 30, 50 years old. What member states would like is to actually see leadership from the chief executives within these organizations. Mm -hmm. But leadership that is based on an astute understanding of where the red lines are, mm 
but at the same time an understanding that if we trust you and you lead not beyond ignoring our interests, we will give you freedom to lead because we actually need you to lead because our domestic politics very often prevents us from articulating things. So I think the leadership question becomes extremely relevant. And I must say, after 10 years of having been a UN Under Secretary General and led an entity in the UN, I still remain surprised at the degree of trust that then translates into freedom to either articulate, reframe, or catalyze uh, discussions. That's very interesting. And I think this theme of leadership is definitely one we're seeing come up again and again. Um, and, and on that note, can I turn to you, Sam, to uh, tell us a bit about, you know, Akeem mentioned that um, an organization succeeds by having a very clear sense of what its role is within the UN system, what its mandate is, and being, becoming the best possible version of what it's meant to be. So if we look across the whole system, do you think we have in place the right number of organizations, the right number of agencies and programs doing the right kinds of things? Where do you see kind of the overlaps being most difficult or where are there gaps that need more kind of filler being put in? What's the sort of big picture here? Um, well, the big picture, if you look at the UN organogram for the first time, um, it, it's almost as scary as, as the prospect of Donald Trump being um, <laughs> appointed uh, president of the US on, on the 9th of November. It's, it's this huge spaghetti um, junction of, of overlapping uh, organizations. So in terms of whether there's a right number, there are, there are six principal organs of the UN, one suspended, there's 13 funds and programs, um, 15 specialized agencies, five regional um, uh, commissions, uh, six training organizations, and sort of nine major other related organizations. So is that the right number? Is that, is that the Goldilocks number, that too, too many or too, too few? In a way, it's impossible, I think, to, to uh, even even begin to think about the number or size, unless you talk about the, the issues that, that Akin raised, of what's the purpose of each of those elements. So it, it sort of my, my answer to that question would begin to saying, how do you understand why the status quo is where, where it is? We don't start with a blank, blank slate. The reform can be difficult. Some agencies predate the UN even existing and are very resistant to coordination. And overall, we've had a, 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 a centrifugal system evolved where there's no real control from the centre, either really from the Secretary General or the, or the General Assembly. And pressure for the different UN entities to exist and to grow in a way that, that, that Nina so, so articulately describes in her book um, comes from both the secretariats but also from member states on governing boards who become attached. And often even it's at the, at the level of um, ministries within governments, particularly but not exclusively in developing countries, that the transport ministry or the treasury or the, the health ministry may have a particular relationship to um, one UN agency or one donor and very re resistant to actually letting go of that in the interest of greater kind of coordination. So the second element of the question of, of do we have the right, the right number or the right, right size, again, is that, that different parts of the UN system may work on the same issue um, but contribute in different ways. So some parts of the UN provide a, um, a venue for member states to meet and negotiate solutions. Others elaborate norms, rules, and, and laws. Others monitor in progress, um, maintain statistics and, and data on which countries can make better decisions. Some help with technical assistance, food aid, mediation, peacekeeping, etc., cetera, on, on the ground. Mm. And the UN is changing, just as a backdrop of the world is changing, so that finance flows, um, you know, uh, 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 things like um, uh, the foreign direct investment or remittances um, dwarf ODA, the UN has to re respond. So the future role of the UN may be less about delivering global public goods uh, and more about establishing norms and rules, sort of helping coordinate disparate actors and mobilizing additional resources. So again, that then has a huge effect on, on, on the number. And my last sort of two quick points on this would be that in reforming international organizations, as Akim said, there's always a tension between the desire to reduce the number of overall entities and the desire to, to mainstream particular issues. And I think climate change is one, probably also ensuring that human rights uh, principles are at the heart of decision making. Um, and 
that, that all entities should contribute to gender equality. I think those three things, there's always been that tension across the UN system. So you saw in the case of DPKO peacekeeping, uh, uh, BAN decided to actually create two entities and break them apart. In the case of UN Women, four entities relating to, to women's equality and, 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 and gender were brought together. So sometimes the answer will be create more and sometimes it'll bring together. And the last, but I, don't, I, I won't dwell on it now, but hopefully come back to it, is that member states provide often contrary incentives, particularly in financial set incentives, to secretariats through both their funding and their assessment systems. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important point to realize that um, institutional reform in any organization, but especially in the United Nations system, is a complicated process involving many interests, many stakeholders, many vested interests, many decision makers. Um, and just as if you were building a university today, you may not come up with Oxford University sort of naturally, just from blank strat, uh, a sort of blank slate. Um, we necessarily have all these different colleges and departments and faculties and things. Um, after 800 years of path-dependent institutional development, this is nonetheless what we have, and it, you know we can we can make it work pretty well. So some interesting parallels there. Um, I'm curious, though, Sam, we have now a kind of moment of change in the UN system with a new Secretary General coming in, one who plays a fairly a fairly leading role in your book, Nina. Um, what should he be thinking about for these bigger kind of mandate overlap questions? Uh, I think you you. You know, identified a few areas where there's some concentrations, maybe some areas where there's some some more threadbare kind of things. But given that, um, according to Nina, he's certainly no stranger to mandate expansion or uh, evolution, um, what would be our advice to him? I, I suppose first, uh, he, uh, Antonio Guterres needs a convincing narrative of of how the world is changing, and therefore how the UN system needs to adapt and change to, uh, to respond to that. And that's not just w w the things I mentioned about financial flows, but, but the negatives, the transnational threats like the regionalization of conflict, organized crime, terrorism, cyber, cyber attacks. They challenge the very notion of international organizations based on the unit of member states and member state consent. Mm. And uh, uh, the other part of the narrative, I think, has to be that over the next 20 years, um, the, the current sort of generation will be, be seeing remarkable breakthroughs in technology, in science, in medicine, in engineering that will actually transform the opportunities for uh, the United Nations making, making progress. On the issue of climate change specifically, Ban Ki-moon last year at a university in, in Belgium said that, that we are the, the first generation that can actually end poverty, but we're also the last generation that has a chance to end or tackle climate change adequately. So I think that, that, that means that, that, that he will need to make climate change uh, an imperative across the, across the UN system. Mm. Uh, in terms of how to do it, I think beginning to cultivate member state champions, particularly mm -hmm. in permanent missions in, in New York, um, and in, including uh, how the UN can become an enabler of investment from non-state non, um, uh, sources and building multi-stakeholder multi partnerships. BAN had some success, minor success with Every Woman, Every Child and Sustainable Energy for All initiatives, but faced real resistance from the group of 77 developing countries in, in widening the partnerships office within, within the, his own office. So I think that will be a, a, um, a, a real important challenge is actually to get member state buy-in from that. Um, and a recognition that legitimacy means very different things in the eyes of different groups of member states. So donors will often see legitimacy through the eyes of, of, uh, of effectiveness and, and inputs, out, outcomes, impact, and so on. While developing countries will often see um, legitimacy as including that, but also including um, the, the, uh, the ability to be involved in the decision-making and the governance of those organizations. Mm -hmm. um, recognizing where the UN should bow out where actually other actors are better placed, um, and uh, that leadership's important, appointing good communicators. Um, uh, Kandel Yumkala would be um, uh, a great example, and, and the, the individual on my right is um, <laughs> it's people who have, have really... It's good of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. Uh, have been able to really convey not just what the UN needs to do now, but how it needs to change to, 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 to remain relevant. 
Um, and the last two things that I think he needs to do, to include incentives for collaboration across the UN system. It is very diff difficult in a decentralized system that, that, that Nina describes. And one of, one of the ways you can do that is in the, in the compact that he agrees with each Under Secretary General and the accountability framework to, to include collaboration um, w un under that as part of the, uh, what he will hold them to at the end of each year. And much can be done without member state approval. Um, I'll never forget an Indian permanent representative to the UN mentioning to me his disappointment when some of Ban's attempts to undertake changes to the Secretariat fell through. And Ban had been conducting um, these breakfast meetings, very informal breakfast meetings with member states. And it'd be very informal, you'd chat about what he was intended to do within the Secretariat. And, and when there was an outlier, when there was someone not quite happy, they would then be invited to come and, and join the group. And it was this process over many, many months and very, very quiet, very, very informal. And member states generally had got on board. And then what somebody in Ban's office did is he sent a copy for information to the fifth committee, to the finance committee and the ACABQ. And I can be sure you know what happened. They instantly jumped on it and, 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 and basically said, no, you can't do this. We need to approve it, blah, 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 blah. And what the Indian ambassador had said was that 90% of what he was proposing could have just been done and, and then the UN would change and member states would have accepted. So I think that's one of the things is, is the, the sort of the courage which is necessary for the next Secretary General, uh, as, I, as I can describe also, to know when to, when to act and when to consult. Mm. Right. So better to sometimes to ask for forgiveness than permission, perhaps, in the UN system. Um, I think it's really interesting, though, to think about the bigger picture and what um, whether there's actually an expansion of what we ask of all international organizations, or at least the UN system, to do. So reaching out beyond traditional interstate relations, for example, to mobilize new kinds of partnerships, as, for example, you've worked on very hard at UNEP over the past decade or so, um, is in some ways a, an interesting sort of system-wide expansion. Um, but how do we mobilize that support we need to, to you know, make international organizations fit for purpose in this era of very, very complicated, very difficult challenges. Because you know, I think if we all read the news, we look around the world, we see the failure to govern migration, the failure to govern certain kinds of disasters, the failure to govern, for example, different kinds of uh, economic issues, such as financial crises or, or trade impacts on workers in different countries, uh, actually creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where the failure to manage globalization and interdependence or global issues make, promotes politi politics within countries that then make it more difficult to manage those issues. And I don't need to speak about the American election just to provide a case in point. Um, so how do we, is there something bigger here about mobilizing political support, both at, from international organizations or, or in domestic politics, for the kinds of solutions we need? Um, and it, are there any kind of threads of, of um, hope that we can cling to to make that happen? It's a, it's a difficult question, but it's something that I think about a lot these days. I would jump in on that and take the question a little bit differently, though, because I think one theme we haven't discussed enough is about funding. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the really big challenges in the UN system as a whole is that the majority of funding is earmarked. What that means is that member states, rather than going through the board, so in general in, in international organizations, we consider a board of people sitting around a table like this and saying, we're going to delegate you this task. Here's the money to do it. We all collectively agree this is an important priority, and that's multilateralism. Now, that's being diverted because I, as the US, the UK, the France, say, yeah, I agree to that collectively, but I'm going to go over here and prioritize another issue that I think is important and fund the organization to do that, even if the collective haven't agreed on it. And so earmarked funding has become a major problem in the UN system, where I think it's about over 60% of multilateral aid funding is earmarked because it distorts the mandates and undermines multilateralism. So I think one area that we could hope to see some real change, maybe the new UN Secretary General Guterres can try and push back on it. I know a lot of executive heads have. I know the head of IOM, William Lacey Swing, has tried to push back. And that's important because then if organizations have greater discretionary budgets, if executive heads have a budget that's not all tied up by what individual member states want, they can have that discretion that you were describing, and it would be interesting to hear your experience of that. Um, so I think that's one area that's very important. And it's also coming back to the book um, and to some of the research I've done, I've really seen in many cases that 
some of the competition Alex was describing is happening because new pots of money are becoming available. That there's a whole lot of new environmental and climate change funds that organisations can access and the ones that can access are often are going to then expand into those areas because it gives them, it gives them a, a, a resource base. Absolutely. Akeem, do you have a thought on the earmarking question about how it can you know, lead as, things astray? As always, it's, <clears throat> it's multiple factors that play into this. I think in part um, the, the challenge and in, in a sense the scale of how to finance a corresponding capacity to the mandate that you've been given has just grown enormously. Um, I mean, the refugee numbers being just one, right? We dealt with, you know, a million here or a million there, and then there were some peaks that lasted for a year or two, and now we have 50, 60, maybe soon 70 million that are just the political refugees. So the first thing is governments are generally, you know, living through a period of, you know, either induced or imposed austerity, so they have to make choices, and surrendering money to an international system is removing an element of direct control. So this is one force that plays out and I think we, we simply have to acknowledge that a new Secretary General I think needs to begin by actually showing to the world what a ridiculous, ridiculous argument we're having over funding to the UN. And if you think about the full spectrum of what the UN enables us as 7 billion people to do together every day from planes flying to letters reaching people to human rights and then we have, you know, uh, less than $20 billion deployed for this entire global effort. It's actually the biggest bargain for an individual country to create a capacity to solve a problem that no individual country could solve. I mean, mm -hmm. that's where I think a new Secretary General needs to establish both a narrative to the public and then a compact with member states to reframe this perception that the UN is somehow a great deal of money wasted. It is inefficient, it is bureaucratic, it does absolutely anachronistic things. But in the larger scheme of things, you really cannot question that from a finance point of view because it just dwarfs compared to other amounts of waste that we see every day. Mm -hmm. A second part is quite frankly related, which is efficiency. If a UN organization is increasingly perceived to be running itself as a bureaucracy, the proportion of earmark funding goes up because you're no longer buying into the value proposition of a mandate like ICAO or UNEP or you know, WHO. And to me it was very interesting. UNEP operated for much of its um, history since 72 with less than 3% of its funding coming out of a general assembly allocation. I 97% of the funding that an executive director had at his or her disposal at the beginning of the year um, was essentially unpredictable and any member state could have just walked away from it. Now, how do you run an intelligent, efficient organization when, you know, one day you have 20 million, the next day you may have 10 million? And to me it was interesting in then creating the confidence in the efficacy of the institution resulting in this, to me, still remarkable decision first when Rio to create an environment assembly, but secondly also in the General Assembly at a moment where governments were cutting a hundred million dollars off Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's budget, actually giving UNEP a 200% increase. Mm. Now, you know, that may have been an accident of history, but I don't think it was. It was essentially an expression of both the issue has become much more central to what we need the UN for, mm. and we like what this organization has demonstrated in terms of, you know, value for money, accountability, results-based management. So both factors play a key role. And here comes the second challenge for an incoming Secretary General, whether it is now Antonio or whether it is his predecessors. You need to find a way, and there is no simple solution to that, in how you can create a sense of collective management. Because we have this extraordinary thing called the Chief Executive Board. I mean, if you imagine this room here with a table with about 42 of us meeting twice a year for two full days literally every head of a specialized agency, the heads of the Bretton Woods institutions, the heads of the UN program sitting together for two days, one of which is in complete closed retreat. I cannot think of another group of people as empowered and potentially capable of providing leadership to what happens next. And yet, you know, governance you mentioned. I mean, we have the specialized agencies. The General Assembly has no right 
essentially to tell the WHO, the FAO, what to do. They have their entire separate governing bodies. So here comes the second part of what I think a Secretary General needs to look for in terms of a new compact with member states to say, if you want the system to function better as opposed to just its individual elements, then you must govern with more cohesion with your various inputs in these different governing bodies. Because right now, any head of UN agency of a special agency can say, all very well what we discussed here, but sorry, Ban Ki-moon, I have my own governing body. And this is where member states and a Secretary General really need a compact. The UN is perfectly reformable, but it is based on an agreement between the Secretary General and member states to play to the same rules of the game. Mm -hmm. And then I think you could see remarkable transformation happening in less than a decade. Mm. Well, that's very inspirational. And I want to come to you on the sand, but first I want to go to Alex and ask, you know, refugees, migration is such a political issue now in a way that probably it hasn't been for decades. It's really in the front page of the news and it's changing politics in big countries in important ways. Do you see some way where that may lead to the kind of political will to do what Akeem is suggesting? I mean, I think the track record of reform in specialized agencies is pretty poor. I mean, radical change in UN specialized agencies doesn't happen often. But when it does happen is at crisis moments. So 1971, the international monetary system is able to reform. Um, end of the Cold War, the trade system shifting from GATT to WTO is able to shift. Towards the tail end of the most recent global financial crisis, the G8 is replaced by the G20 as the major international financial decision-making body. So it takes crisis, and I think 2015 should in a way have been the refugee regime's 1971 moment that opportunity to say, certain things are not working, how can we change them? The challenge, of course, is that, yes, you do get incremental change over time in organizations like UNHCR, but where there's resistance within a bureaucracy to change, it's very hard to introduce that unless you have the kind of compact, a kind of renegotiation of the rules of the game that involves donor states collectively recognizing that things are not as they should be, and the Secretary General leading that type of change. At the moment, for instance, I think it's very clear on certain metrics that UNHCR is not performing particularly well. If the metric is collective action, yes, we can't say collective action failure on refugees is exclusively the fault of a UN agency. It's not. It's the fault of a large number of states, particularly European states, donor states, um, that are failing to come up with the resources, the commitments that are closing their borders. There's a huge amount of organized hypocrisy in the system. Nevertheless, we have a UN refugee agency that is monopolizing the refugee assistance space, partly because of its historical mandate, and in certain cases, not fulfilling that on the ground. Let's take Turkey, a country that hosts more refugees than any country in the world, 2.6 million. Less than 10% of the Syrian refugees in Turkey will receive any assistance whatsoever from UNHCR or its implementing partners. The UNHCR model is designed to provide care and maintenance in refugee camps. The majority of the world's refugees are not in refugee camps, and it struggles to provide assistance in urban areas where more than half of the world's refugees are. So a new business model is needed, and UNHCR does very well the things it does. It is good at humanitarian relief in emergencies. It's good at providing support in refugee camps, sometimes for decades. It's good at providing legal advice to governments. But some of the real skills that are needed today are political facilitation, political engagement, proactive leadership in terms of what's happening in Europe and the Middle East, economics and development to say business is needed to engage. We need a development approach that doesn't leave refugees in camps for the long term. And yet there's resistance within the system to that kind of root and branch reform, partly because jobs are at stake. You need different kinds of human resource structure, but ultimately, that's not going to happen unless donor states ask for change and unless they have a coherent vision of an alternative. And so you get that inertia where while it would be in everyone's interest to have change, even for the organization, mm -hmm. which has an indispensable role in the contemporary world, mm -hmm. the collective action to bring about that change is lacking. Right. So I see a lot of burning questions on the floor, but before we uh, open it up, and please be thinking about your questions if you haven't thought so about them yet, uh, Sam, did you have a, a comment on this? Yeah, oh, a quick one on, on finance and then on, on UN reform. On, on finance, I think the other 
real shift we've seen since 2008 and austerity coming in with donors has been a, a different approach. Under Kofi Annan, donors agreed to the delivering as one, whereby different UN agencies subsumed their brand under the UN Development Programme lead at the country level. Since 2008, there's been a much greater need for donors to demonstrate to their publics that money is being well spent. And the way they've interpreted that is to show uh, things which are measurable and, and that, that, that seem to be um, uh, good, good value, like inoculating children or, or handing out, handing out uh, textbooks. So it's resulted in actually um, brand becoming much more important. The multilateral aid review that DFID introduced, the British government introduced, measures all entities on two criteria. One is on managerial competence, and the other is um, the achievement of development objectives on the ground, these things that are very measurable. But it, it therefore neglects a couple of things. It neglects to see value in agencies which have um, uh, a role in, in norm provision or in, in other things that can't be measured at the, at the end. And, and what the SDG process, Sustainable Development Goal process, told us, if anything, is that long-term um, prevention matters, building in resilience matters, inclusive and accountable institutions matter. But none of those are easy to, to measure in, in terms of the, the, sort of the, the MAR framework. Um, and the other, um, the other thing it does is I think it increases uh, the appointment of, um, by some agencies of good strategic communication staff who can speak the, um, the language of the day of management consultancy speak that is, is flavor of the day for, 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 for donors rather than actually make any substantial changes. My point on, um, on, on UN reform, what was it, sorry. Um, I can't find it. Uh, hopefully it will come up in questions. So I'll sure come we'll back to it. Lots of chances now to have questions on UN reform and any of the other issues we've touched on. Um, so if I could ask you to identify yourself before you ask your question, that would be very helpful. And of course, a question at the Venice School should end with a question mark and an inflection, meaning there's an actual query involved. So um, please, who would like to go first? Please. And I think there's a roving microphone that will come and help us, which will help us. Uh, this event is being webcast, so it will help the people watching in other places hear you if the microphone is there. Uh, I mean, it's a very rich panel. Thank you all very much. It was tremendous. Um, I suppose my question really is um, about how embedded this climate change um, issue and the linkage with the international organization, as Nina has argued in her book, how, how embedded is it truly? I mean, listening to the panel um, and thinking about, uh, as a non-expert on, on the UN, I mean, thinking about the Ban Ki-moon period as Secretary General, I mean, I, I would see the rhetoric as about climate change, as about rights up front, as about gender, peace, development, violence. That, that, those are the sort of three things as a non-expert that I see um, as coming out of that Ban Ki-moon period. And so in some ways, the climate change issue already has got to fight a, quite a complex rhetorical environment. And, and then on top of that, particularly some of the things that Alex was saying and, and you were eliciting from him, this idea that we have immediate crises now. We have the refugee issue and the migration issue in particular. And, and alongside that, we have a kind of a movement in climate change agreements which suggests that some of the air may have been taken out of it. I take Sam's point that Ban Ki-moon said, you know, this is our last opportunity to solve this major problem. But as you know, I mean, the immediate crisis is the one that really is always the thing that's going to be dealt with rather than, you know, the slow-paced climate change. Mm -hmm. and, and here we are, you know, congratulating ourselves anyway um, about this agreement. So, so I suppose I'm, I'm saying, given that these, the, Nina is arguing that these mandates changed, that rhetoric changed, that structures changed, you know, uh, uh, how, how, have, we, have we actually moved really away from that? And, mm -hmm. and how embedded was this idea? And is it an idea really whose time has come and come and gone. Yeah. So Nina, is the, is the embeddedness there? Um, it's a great question. Thanks for that, Rosemary. 
First of all, I would say that there is obviously an element of rhetoric, and like you pointed out, Ban Ki-moon during his period made climate change a real priority. There was the Greening the Blue initiative. All of the UN agencies at Copenhagen profiled themselves as we are working on climate change and had task forces that they set up internally so that every UN agency had to come together internally and think about what their climate change policy was. However, I would say that there is some variation, and I think if I was to talk about it broadly across the UN system, I'd say the difference is partly between humanitarian and development. And the development agencies have had to think more carefully about climate change, and they've had greater incentives to because organizations like UNDP have access to a lot of the adaptation funds. UNDP was one of the core entities that helped set up the Global Environment Facility. And so as a result, they both have to rethink what doing development is, and they have financing opportunities to expand. Now, in the case of organizations like UNHCR, International Organization for Migration, which do a lot more humanitarian assistance, they are seeing the effects, clearly, of climate change. They're having to go out and work in natural disasters like we've heard talked about, um, whether it be in Haiti and Ecuador. But it's more as a symptom. They're not necessarily, in, I would argue, as systematically rethinking their work. Um, they, and they are rethinking it, but not to the same extent. And they don't have the same level of, of financing as climate change. Uh, labeled as climate change. So they're dealing with natural disasters, but not necessarily always making such a distinct link. Great. Any other thoughts on that question? Let's collect some more questions. And I saw one here, uh, and then here, and then here. And maybe we could uh, take them all as a group so that we don't take another group after that. Let me start with the gentleman in the, in the gray jacket. Thank you. The second question was here in the uh, woman in the, in the you, you asked a question, yes? The woman in the striped shirt, no. Someone in the middle here who had a question? Sorry, the gentleman here in the, in the blue jump, please. Apologies. Yeah, hello. Um, now this is related to... So I guess say who you are first. Sir, ah, sorry. My name is Pedro. I'm standing here at the MPP. And, uh, well, my question was about, uh, you, you mentioned that maybe Agencies like UNHCR, uh, they, 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 they're mostly in uh, responding like emergencies. Um, but for instance, in, uh, in Latin America, I'm, I'm from Argentina, but I've been working with Doctors Without Borders for the last two, three years in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, what I saw there is one now, the El Nino. And El Nino is something that, what I understood, is so with the climate change is getting worse and worse in some way, and it's something that can be prevented. And uh, what do the agencies do regarding those, this kind of uh, phenomena that could be prevented? I, I say this because I could see, for instance, the last two years there was the drought in the north of, uh, the, this is the border between Colombia and Venezuela, La Guajira, and it was quite, quite chaotic. I think it was UNICEF. They were mostly there working with the government. There were political issues because the government was thinking at the peace agreement, etc. So they didn't want people to come to see that there, was, you know, there were nutrition problems, etc. But uh, just the question again should be, uh, it is, uh, are there any plans so, or how do they work in, in those issues that we more or less can foresee what's going on? to happen. Yeah. Great. So how do we respond to these crises in an effective way? A uh, young woman here, please. Hi. Uh, Geraldine Rittenhouse, and I'm studying diplomacy. My question relates to governance design, um, specifically with the UN. You'd mentioned um, a call to uh, 
increased governance consistency across groups internal to the United Nations. I'm wondering with respect to building that consistency tactically, um, what are your thoughts around how to most effectively go through that? Are there any good case studies with which we could draw upon to really uh, approach this issue? Thank you. Thank you. So I start with those three questions and um, ask the panel which of us would like to engage with them. Uh, maybe Nita, you can speak to the first question about the linkages. Yeah, yeah so the, the question was about to what extent are the international organizations I'm studying anticipating and following developments in the UNFCCC? And actually, it's the perfect opportunity for me to say the, the second chapter of the book on issue linkages is, is it following that exact process. How does the climate change negotiations evolve over time? And how do the linkages that I argue are, are constructed, that's not to say that there aren't connections between climate change and displacement, but how they become constructed by NGOs, states, and other actors. And what I, what I see is that in the 90s, it was more mitigation focused. In the 2000s, adaptation becomes a bigger part of the negotiations, partly, as I mentioned earlier, because we're seeing the impacts of, of um, climate change in, term of, in terms of humanitarian disasters and development NGOs, be it Oxfam, as well as environmental NGOs like Greenpeace are all starting to really say, we need to do adaptation. Because earlier on in the 90s, adaptation was actually seen as a, a threat to the negotiations. A lot of environmentalists didn't want to talk about adaptation because it would mean admitting defeat. So what kind of examples can I, can I give you on how organizations did um, adapt? Well, first of all, they started to send UNHCR, IOM, UNDP, higher and higher level officials to the negotiations. Initially, UNHCR, IOM wouldn't have even attended the negotiations. Why would they bother to be in a room of people, scientists, discussing how to you know, decrease carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, that's not relevant for UNHCR. But once you start to say, oh, these are affecting people, then you see a whole host of other actors. So I have another research showing how the negotiations expand to include other actors. And they're also lobbying member states. And one important thing we haven't talked about is actually organizations are promoting as well migration as a positive coping strategy. It's an adaptation. It's something that we can, people have always migrated and should and continue to do to cope with climate change. And IOM was part of a group that lobbied to get that into the negotiations and managed in Cancun in paragraph 14F to include migration as an adaptation strategy. So there is much um, yeah, influence going that way too. Right. And what about this question of responsiveness to crises? I don't know, Alex, if you have some thoughts on that. How can organizations uh, maybe move beyond a responsive, reactive way into a more proactive way. I, mean, I think this connects a little bit to Rosemary's question about how things embed. Um, I think it's amazing how practices often embed. Things don't have to be institutionalized in order to become path dependent over time. I think when you look across organizations, including UNHCR's work, you often get panic legacies. You get a particular crisis emerging and a series of practices emerging to address that particular crisis that become de facto institutionalized over time and become the source of historical memory to deal with the next crisis on the basis of the previous. I think that, for instance, is part of the explanation for how camps became the default. UNHCR was never set up to be a camp maintenance organization. It was set up partly in a context where self-reliance was the norm and camps emerged particularly in the 80s and 90s as a default response to particular crises in particular contexts and became entrenched and became part of the DNA of the organization. I think arguably we see that a little bit with the response to uh, disaster-induced displacement, that UNHCR started doing this informally for particular crises as they emerged, the Asian tsunami, and that legitimated a response that continued based on similar rollout. So those, those, at the time, ad hoc responses become the ones that we go back to as organizations to address the next crisis. And so I think those two questions go quite well together um, because I think things get stuck that were never intended to stick. Now what about this question of tactics? So even though some organizations are you know, going to be ad hoc and reactive, and this will accrete over time. You know, the question here is really, how do we tactically you know, move these issues forward? So I don't know if Sam or Akeem, you have some thoughts on this. Well, 
my experience when when I was working in the in in uh, Kofi Annan's office in the early 2000s was that the, the perspective from the Secretariat was generally well, there's nothing that we we can't do if it wasn't for these really annoying member states and uh, you know the blockages that they're putting on etc cetera, etc cetera. the mandates they're producing are often compromises for political reasons that have nothing to do with the outputs on which we're being judged mm -hmm. they often do the compromise with something that's happening in another fora or they're deliberately designed to actually prevent action from happening mm -hmm. uh, i think there's been some improvement from that and that's an over generalization but then when i when i worked for the british government um, on un issues the, the same the blame the other arose, or basically saying, you know, we're, if only the Secretariat wasn't so bureaucratic or wasn't, you know, or was actually implementing these things in an effective, creative way. The only semi sort of academic study that I've seen um, that, that really brings those two things together was actually something called the Four Nations Initiative in 2005. It didn't have much publicity, but it was an initiative of Chile, uh, South Africa, Sweden, um, and Thailand. And their, their approach to governance and to UN reform was that you needed both to look at the mandate cycle of actually how, what was written down in, in, in the resolutions and, and uh, the instructions given, and you had to look at the incentives that, this, that the Secretariat um, was given by, by, by member states uh, to act in particular ways and to, to fulfill or not fulfill uh, the mandates. Um, and I think that's a really great starting point. Um, and then on top of that, you have to take Akim's point that, that actually, just whatever it says in the mandate, if you have the trust of member states and you develop that over time, good leadership can, can break beyond mandates and, and find creative ways to do that. So I think that the prob the probably the solution is somewhere in between, mm. recognizing that, those, that the, the other is not to blame, bringing together those two aspects and then being courageous on top of it and, mm -hmm. and doing, doing what's right anyway. Sounds like very wise advice. Uh, Akeem, anything to add on tactics or the other questions that we've tackled? Yes, and I, I think you know, tactics are good if you have the conditions in which they can succeed. I mean, to put it very brutally, member states of the United Nations are sovereign. So the first departure point is can you establish among sovereign nations a shared agenda for acting together. And this is far beyond the rhetoric. And we forget that you know, the United Nations General Assembly was a great force for progressive, normative um, work throughout the 60s and 70s because what coincided there was a group of nations, industrialized world, realizing that they had to somehow figure out a new relationship with the South and the decolonization movement aligning itself with the sense that the General Assembly was a great place in which to move forward their agenda. And out of that arose an alliance on progressive, normative, and also institutional and political effort. The last 20 years, quite frankly, have been disastrous for the UN in the sense that member states have simply not seen the rationale for acting collectively through the United Nations, which has translated into a degree of benign neglect that you can witness not only in the Security Council, because differences are why the United Nations exists. I mean, I always would caution those who think that because a Security Council or a General Assembly is divided, the UN is useless. No, that's precisely why we have a UN. So don't take conflict and disagreement as a failure, but rather look at the art and the skill of diplomacy and tactics and also of how a Secretary General how heads of agencies, but also leadership from within individual member states can create a sense of interest and value, including then the preparedness to make compromises, because multilateralism can only work on the formula of compromise. Mm. And I think here, you know, I, I'm very intrigued by this point of the crisis, Alex, because in one sense, crises are great. But what they actually do is, in a sense, force us to do things by default rather than by design. I think part of the mess we have today is that we have tried to reform the UN system on the back of crisis rather than going back to the fundamental DNA, which is collective security, shared responsibility, are actually things we need more than ever before. And when the UN succeeds, it's almost not noticed. I mean, just to go back to your point, I think Ban Ki-moon, in a historical perspective, will deserve enormous credit for having stuck with the climate change topic. After Copenhagen, everybody advised him to walk away from it. 
he stuck with it. And he basically for three years was being told by member states and by his own advisors and many of us, not me because obviously I had a different view of it, <laughs> that this should not be your focus because, you know, it's just not ready. And here we are in the middle of a drifting apart moment of the world again, you know, post-Cold War kind of memories emerging. The UN broke us in 2015 the first ever global sustainable development agenda. No more north and south, but actually we all have something that we will do together because we depend on one another doing it together. Then comes the Paris Agreement, which, you know, scientists will rightly point to is not yet enough. But, you know, for the first time after 30 years of moving an issue from the realm of science fiction, the UN persistently convened the world through the IPCC and then the UNFCCC to confront the consequence of inaction. Here we are, we have a Paris Agreement. And just a few days ago, Montreal. We have potentially just taken half a degree of global warming out of the short-term equation for the next 50 years. Does the world sit up? It took it 25 years to see what an extraordinary thing the Montreal Protocol was, to do something that people thought was, again, science fiction in the period when it was set up. A hole in the ozone layer. Can't be true. Oh, can't fix it. And here we are, the biggest planetary repair job ever undertaken is through the UN's Montreal Protocol, the most universal um, signed agreement, and I would argue, in a sense, precisely the antidote that a Secretary General has to convey to the public. We are being misled by media, by political interests, and also by those who benefit from a divided UN to look at all the bad things that happen every day. You know, whether in peacekeeping or in bureaucratic failure or in the inability to solve issues. But that is also part of a deliberate way of undermining multilateralism because you actually lose a sense of the bigger picture and you don't judge the institution anymore by what it actually is meant and could be doing if only. And that's why I think tactics can be literally at the level of that shared agenda and it can come down to some of those very simple things. I often wondered what would have happened to the climate change issue if the Global Environment Facility had, when it was established, been given to UNEP not to use for its own projects, but as the financial lever to get the whole UN system to essentially think about environment in development in humanitarian context instead of the construct, which was another logic. Small secretariat, get three of the big agencies that are relevant, World Bank, UNDP, and UNEP, to be funded through something that will create synergies. Well, the synergies, quite frankly, didn't happen. And in the meantime, the GEF secretariat is evolving into a separate entity. So on both fronts, interesting lessons in design. But tactics is also about funding. So if you want the WHO to bring health into the work of all those who are relevant, give it the financial lever to fund others in the system to do things because that is how you can make very quickly partnerships emerge. Mm -hmm. So the spectrum of tactics, I think, is enormous. But the problem is we lack a sense amongst all of us, if you're honest, of a confidence that multilateralism can recover. And that is, I think, the conversation that we need right now. Well, I think that's an excellent note to bring our discussion to a close on, uh, because that is the conversation we need, and one I think, Nina, your book is advancing us further. So apologies for those of you who weren't able to ask your questions, but um, as Akeem says, this is a conversation that we'll be having again and again and again over the next few years, so we look forward to having you back here to continue that discussion. Um, you know, I think, Akeem, your comments reminded me of a quote from James Madison, one of the authors of the American Constitution, who said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Similarly, if all international politics were harmony, no international institutions would be necessary. But I think our panel discussion tonight, and Nina, your book especially, shows us just how necessary they are and how they may be evolving in ways that we can't quite, we didn't first see when we set them up, and how that may be actually part of our solution to some of these problems. So thank you to the panel. Thank you to Nina for writing the book. Thank you to all of you here for joining us. And please join me in thanking our speakers tonight.